The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 2, Section 2, Continued. Cassette 11, Side 1. They shot Tukhachevsky, and then they cut off Blucher's head, too. Or what about the famous medical professors Vinogradov and Sherashevsky? Today we recall that they themselves were victims of the malevolent slander of 1952, but they themselves signed the no less malevolent slander against their colleagues Pletnev and Levin in 1936. And the great laureate kept himself in training, both in theme and in individual souls. People lived in the field of betrayal, and their best powers of reasoning were used in justification of it. In 1937, a husband and wife were awaiting arrest, because the wife had come from Poland. And here is what they agreed on. Before the actual arrest, the husband denounced the wife to the police. She was arrested, and by the same token, he was purified in the eyes of the NKVD, and stayed free. And in that same glorious year, the pre-revolutionary political prisoner Adolf Mezhov, going off to prison, proclaimed to his one and only beloved daughter, Isabella, We have devoted our lives to Soviet power, and therefore let no one make use of your injury. Enter the Komsomol. Under the terms of his sentence, Mezhov was not forbidden correspondence, but the Komsomol forbade his daughter to engage in any correspondence. And in the spirit of her father's testament, the daughter renounced her father. How many of these renunciations there were at that time? Some of them made in public, some of them in the press. I, the undersigned, from such and such a date, renounce my father and my mother as enemies of the Soviet people. And thus they purchased their lives. Those who are not alive during that time, or who do not live today in China, will find it nearly impossible to comprehend and forgive this. In ordinary human societies, the human being lives out his sixty years without ever getting caught in the pincers of that kind of choice, and he himself is quite convinced of his decency, as are those who pronounce speeches over his grave. A human being departs from life without ever having learned into what kind of deep well of evil one can fall. And the mass mange of souls does not spread through society instantly. During all the twenties and the beginning of the thirties, many in our country still preserved their souls and the concepts of the former society, to help in misfortune, to defend those in difficulties. And even as late as 1933, Nikolai Vavilov and Meister openly petitioned on behalf of all the arrested staff members of the All-Union Scientific Research Institute of Plant Breeding. There is a certain minimal necessary period of corruption prior to which the great apparatus cannot cope with the people. This period is also determined by the age of those stubborn people who have not yet grown old. For Russia, it took 20 years. When the Baltic states suffered mass arrests in 1949, their corruption had only had five or six years to establish itself, and that proved too little, and families that suffered from the government met with support on all sides. Yes, and there was a supplementary cause there, strengthening the resistance of the Baltic peoples. Social oppression there appeared simply as national oppression, and in this case people always fight back more firmly. In evaluating 1937 for the archipelago, we refused it the title of the crowning glory, but here, in talking about freedom, we have to grant it this corroded crown of betrayal. One has to admit that this was the particular year that broke the soul of our freedom and opened it wide to corruption on a mass scale. Yet, even this was not yet the end of our society. As we see today, the end never did come. The living thread of Russia survived, hung on until better times came in 1956, and it is now less than ever likely to die. The resistance was not overt. It did not beautify the epoch of the universal fall, but with its invisible warm veins, its heart kept on beating, 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 beating. And in that awful time, when in apprehensive loneliness precious photographs, precious letters and diaries were burned, when every yellowed piece of paper in the family cupboard all of a sudden gleamed out like a fiery fern of death, 
and could not jump into the stove fast enough. In that awful time, what great heroism was required not to burn things up night after night for thousands and thousands of nights and to preserve the archives of those who had been sentenced, like Polorensky, or of those who were well known to be in disgrace, like the philosopher Fyodorov. And what a blazing, underground, anti-Soviet act of rebellion the story of Lydia Churoskaya, Sofia Petrovna, must have seemed. It was preserved by Isidor Glikin. In blockaded Leningrad, feeling the approach of death, he made his way through the entire city to carry it to his sister and thus to save it. Every act of resistance to the government required heroism quite out of proportion to the magnitude of the act. It was safer to keep dynamite during the rule of Alexander II than it was to shelter the orphan of an enemy of the people under Stalin. Nonetheless, how many such children were taken in and saved? Let the children themselves tell their stories. And secret assistance to families did occur. And there was someone who took the place of an arrested person's wife who had been in a hopeless line for three days so that she could go in to get warm and get some sleep. And there was also someone who went off with pounding heart to warn someone else that an ambush was waiting for him at his apartment and that he must not return there. And there was someone who gave a fugitive shelter, even though he himself did not sleep that night. We have already mentioned those so bold as not to vote in favour of the prompt party executions. And there was also someone who went to the archipelago for defending his unobtrusive, unknown colleagues at work. And sons followed in the footsteps of their fathers. The son of that Rozhansky, Ivan, himself suffered in defence of his colleague Kopelev. At a party meeting of the Leningrad Children's Publishing House, M. M. Meissner stood up and began to defend wreckers in children's literature. And right then and there he was expelled from the party and arrested. And after all, he knew what he was doing. There is evidence in our possession of a heroic case of mass steadfastness, but I require a second independent confirmation of it. In 1930, several hundred cadets of a certain Ukrainian military school arrived at Solovki in their own formation, refusing convoy, because they had refused to suppress peasant disturbances. And in the wartime censorship office in Ryazan in 1941, a girl censor tore up the criminal letter of a front-line soldier whom she did not know, but she was observed tearing it up and putting it into a wastebasket and they pieced the letter back together and arrested her. She sacrificed herself for a distant stranger. And the only reason I heard about this was that it took place in Ryazan, and how many such cases were there unknown. Nowadays it is quite convenient to declare that arrest was a lottery, Ehrenberg. Yes, it was a lottery, all right, but some of the numbers were fixed. They threw out a general dragnet and arrested in accordance with the signed quota figures. Yes, but every person who objected publicly, they grabbed that very minute. And it turned into a selection on the basis of soul, not a lottery. Those who were bold fell beneath the axe, were sent off to the archipelago, and the picture of the monotonously obedient freedom remained unruffled. All those who were purer and better could not stay in that society, and without them it kept getting more and more trashy. You would not notice these quiet departures at all, but they were, in fact, the dying of the soul of the people. 7. Corruption In a situation of fear and betrayal over many years, people survive unharmed only in a superficial bodily sense, and inside they become corrupt. So many millions of people agreed to become stool pigeons, and after all, if some 40 to 50 million people served long sentences in the archipelago during the course of the 35 years up to 1953, including those who died, and this is a modest estimate, being only three or four times the population of Gulag at any one time, and after all, during the war, the death rate there was running 1% per day, then we can assume that at least every third, or at least every fifth case, was the consequence of somebody's denunciation and that somebody was willing to provide evidence as a witness. 
All of them, all those murderers with ink, are still among us today. Some of them brought about the arrest of their neighbours out of fear, and this was only the first step. Others did it for material gain, and still others, the youngest at the time, who are now on the threshold of a pension, betrayed with inspiration, out of ideological considerations, and sometimes even openly. After all, it was considered a service to one's class to expose the enemy. And all these people are among us, and most often they are prospering, and we still rejoice that they are our ordinary Soviet people. Cancer of the soul develops secretly, too, and strikes at that particular part of it where one expects to find gratitude. Fyodor Peregud gave Misha Ivanov food and drink. Ivanov was out of work, and so Peregud got him a job at the Tambov Railroad Car Repair Factory and taught him the trade. He had no place to live, so he let him move in with him like a relative. And then Mikhail Dmitrievich Ivanov sent a denunciation to the NKVD accusing Fyodor Peregud of praising German equipment at dinner at home. You have to know Fyodor Peregud. He was a mechanic, a motor mechanic, a radio operator and repairman, an electrician, a watchmaker, an optician, a foundry man, a model maker a cabinet maker, master of up to twenty different skills. In camp he opened up a shop for precision mechanics. When he lost his leg, he made himself an artificial limb. And so the police came to take Perigord and took his fourteen-year-old daughter to prison too, and M.D. Ivanov was responsible for all that. He came to the trial looking black, and what that meant was that a rotting soul sometimes emerges in the face but soon after he left the factory and began to work for state security in the open. And subsequently, because of his lack of ability, he was made a fireman. In a corrupt society, ingratitude was an everyday run-of-the-mill emotion, and there was almost nothing surprising in it. After the arrest of the plant breeder V.S. Markin, the agronomist A.A. A. Solovyev quite safely stole the variety of wheat which Markin had developed, Taiga 49. And when Markin was rehabilitated twenty years later, Solovyov was unwilling to yield him even half the payment he had received for it. His vesture, November the 15th, 1963. When the Institute of Buddhist Culture was destroyed, all its leading personnel were arrested, and its head, academician Chetbatsky, died, his student Kalyanov came to his widow and persuaded her to give him the books and papers of the deceased. Otherwise, things will go badly because the Institute of Buddhist Culture turned out to be a spy center. Having taken possession of these works, he published part of them, as well as the work of Vostrikov, under his own name, and thus acquired a reputation. There are many scientific reputations in Moscow and in Leningrad that were also built on blood and bones. The ingratitude of students cutting in a skewball swath through our science and technology of the thirties and forties, had a quite understandable explanation. Science passed out of the hands of the real scientists and engineers into the hands of the callow, greedy climbers. By now it is quite impossible to trace and enumerate all these appropriated works and stolen inventions. And what about the apartments taken over from those arrested? And what about their stolen possessions? And during the war, did not this savage trait manifest itself as nearly universal? If there was someone bereaved, bombed out, their home burned down or being evacuated, the neighbors who had survived the disaster, plain Soviet people, tried in those very moments to profit from those who were stricken. The aspects of corruption are varied, and it is not for us to cover them all in this chapter. The overall life of society came down to the fact that traitors were advanced and mediocrities triumphed, while everything that was best and most honest was trampled underfoot. Who can show me one case in the whole country from the thirties to the fifties of a noble person casting down, destroying, driving out a base troublemaker? I affirm that such a case would have been impossible just as it is impossible for any waterfall to fall upward as an exception. After all, no noble person would turn to state security. But for any villain, 
it was always right there at hand. And state security would not stop at anything once it didn't stop at what it did to Nikolai Vavilov. So why should the waterfall fall upward? This easy triumph of mean people over the noble boiled in a black stinking cloud in the crowded capital. But it stank, too, even way up north beneath the honest Arctic storms, at the polar stations so beloved in the legends of the thirties, where the clear-eyed giants of Jack London should have been smoking pipes of peace. At the Arctic station on Domashny Island off Severnaya Zemlya, there were just three people. The non-party chief of the station, Alexander Pavlovich Babich, a much-honored old Arctic explorer. The manual laborer, Yaryomin, who was the only party member and who was also the party organizer hmm, of the station. And the Komsomol member, the Komsomol organizer. The meteorologist, Koryachenko, who was ambitiously trying to shove the chief aside and take his job. Goryachenko dug around among the chief's personal possessions, stole documents and made threats. The Jack London solution would have been for the other two men simply to shove this scoundrel down through the ice. But no. Instead, a telegram was sent to Papanin in the northern sea route headquarters about the necessity of replacing this employee. The party organizer, Yeromin, signed the telegram, but then he confessed to the Komsomol member and together they sent Papanin a party Komsomol telegram just the opposite in content. Papanin's decision was, the collective has disintegrated, remove them to the mainland. They sent the icebreaker Sadko to get them. On board the Sadko, the Komsomol man lost no time at all and provided the ship's political commissar with materials. Babich was arrested on the spot. The principal accusation was that he intended to turn the icebreaker Sadko over to the Germans that same icebreaker on which they were all now sailing. Once ashore, Babbage was immediately put into a preliminary detention cell. Let us imagine for one moment that the ship's commissar was an honest and reasonable person, and that he had summoned Babbage and heard the other side of the question. But this would have meant disclosing a secret denunciation to a possible enemy. And in that case, Goryachenko, through Papanin, would have also procured the arrest of the ship's commissar. The system worked faultlessly. Of course, among individuals who had not been brought up from childhood in the pioneer detachments and the Komsomol cells, there were souls that retained their integrity. At a Siberian station, a husky soldier seeing a trainload of prisoners suddenly rushed off to buy several packs of cigarettes and persuaded the convoy guards to pass them on to the prisoners. And in other places in this book we describe similar cases. But this soldier was probably not on duty and was probably on leave, and he did not have the Komsomol organizer of his unit near him. If he had been on duty in his own unit, he would not have made up his mind to do it because he would have caught hell for it. Yes, and it was possible that even in the other situation the military police may have called him to account for it. 8. The lie as a form of existence. Whether giving in to fear or influenced by material self-interest or envy, people can't nonetheless become stupid so swiftly. Their souls may be thoroughly muddied, but they still have a sufficiently clear mind. They cannot believe that all the genius of the world has suddenly concentrated itself in one head with a flattened, low-hanging forehead, they simply cannot believe the stupid and silly images of themselves which they hear over the radio, see in films, and read in the newspapers. Nothing forces them to speak the truth in reply, but no one allows them to keep silent. They have to talk, and what else but a lie? They have to applaud madly, and no one requires honesty of them. And if in Pravda on May the 20th, 1938, we read the appeal of workers in higher education to Comrade Stalin, heightening our revolutionary vigilance, we will help our glorious intelligence service, headed by the true Leninist, the Stalinist People's Commissar Nikolai Ivanovich Yezhov, to purge our higher educational institutions, as well as all our country, of the remnants of the Trotskyite, Bukharinite, and other counter-revolutionary trash... 
We certainly do not conclude that the entire meeting of a thousand persons consisted solely of idiots, but merely of degenerate liars acceding to their own arrest on the morrow. The permanent lie becomes the only safe form of existence in the same way as betrayal. Every wag of the tongue can be overheard by someone, every facial expression observed by someone. Therefore, every word, if it does not have to be a direct lie, is nonetheless obliged not to contradict the general common lie. There exists a collection of ready-made phrases, of labels, a selection of ready-made lies. And not one single speech, nor one single essay or article, nor one single book, be it scientific, journalistic, critical, or literary, so-called, can exist without the use of these primary clichés. In the most scientific of texts, it is required that someone's false authority or false priority be upheld somewhere, and that someone be cursed for telling the truth. Without this lie, even an academic work cannot see the light of day. And what can be said about those shrill meetings and trashy lunch-break gatherings where you are compelled to vote against your own opinion, to pretend to be glad over what distresses you, be it a new state loan, the lowering of peace rates, contributions to some tank column, Sunday work duties, or sending your children to help on the collective farms, and to express the deepest anger in areas about which you couldn't care less, some kind of intangible, invisible violence in the West Indies or Paraguay. In prison, Tenno recalled with shame how two weeks before his own arrest he had lectured the sailors on the Stalinist Constitution, the most democratic in the world. And, of course, not one word of it was sincere. There is no man who has typed even one page without lying. There is no man who has spoken from a rostrum without lying. There is no man who has spoken into a microphone without lying. But if only it had all ended there, after all it went further than that, every conversation with the management, every conversation in the personnel section, every conversation of any kind with any other Soviet person called for lies, sometimes head-on, sometimes looking over your shoulder, sometimes indulgently affirmative. And if your idiot interlocutor said to you face to face that we were retreating to the Volga in order to decoy Hitler further, or that the Colorado Beatles had been dropped on us by the Americans, it was necessary to agree. It was obligatory to agree. And a shake of the head instead of a nod might well cost you resettlement in the archipelago. Remember the arrest of Trulpenyov in Part 1, Chapter 7? But that was not all. Your children were growing up. If they weren't yet old enough, you and your wife had to avoid saying openly in front of them what you really thought. After all, they were being brought up to be public Morozovs, to betray their own parents, and they wouldn't hesitate to repeat his achievement. And if the children were still little, then you had to decide what was the best way to bring them up, whether to start them off on lies instead of the truth, so that it would be easier for them to live, and then to lie forevermore in front of them too, or to tell them the truth, with the risk that they might make a slip, that they might let it out which meant that you had to instill into them from the start that the truth was murderous, that beyond the threshold of the house you had to lie, only lie, just like Papa and Mama. The choice was really such that you would rather not have any children. The lie as the continuing basis of life. A young, intelligent woman, A.K., who understood everything, came from the capital to teach literature in a higher education institute in the provinces. Her security questionnaire had no black marks on it, and she had a brand new candidate's degree. In her principal course, she saw she had only one party member, and decided that this girl was the one who was bound to be the stool pigeon. There had to be a stool pigeon in every course of that A.K. was convinced. And so she decided to become all buddy-buddy with this party member and pretend friendship with her. Incidentally, according to the tactics of the archipelago, this was a complete miscalculation. What she should have done, on the contrary, was to paste a couple of failing grades on her at the start, and then any denunciations would have looked like sour grapes. And so these two used to meet outside the institute and exchanged photographs. The girl student carried A.K.'s photograph around in her party card case. 
During holiday time, they corresponded tenderly, and in every lecture, A.K. tried to play up to the possible evaluations of her party student. Four years of this humiliating pretense went by. The student completed her course, and by this time her conduct was a matter of indifference to A.K. So when she made her first return visit to the school, A.K. received her with deliberate coldness. The offended student demanded her photograph and letters back and exclaimed, the most dolefully amusing thing about it was that she probably wasn't a stool pigeon, If I finish my degree, I will never cling to this pitiful institute the way you do. And what lectures you gave, as dull as dishwater. Yes, by impoverishing everything, bleaching it out, and clipping it to suit the perceptions of a stool pigeon, A.K. ruined her lectures when she was capable of delivering them brilliantly. As a certain poet said, it wasn't a cult of personality we had, but a cult of hypocrisy. Here, too, of course, one has to distinguish between degrees between the forced, defensive lie and the oblivious, passionate lie of the sort our writers distinguished themselves at most of all, the sort of lie in the midst of whose tender emotion Marietta Chagignan could write in 1937 that the epoch of socialism had transformed even criminal interrogation. The stories of interrogators showed that nowadays the persons being interrogated willingly cooperated with them telling everything that was required about themselves and others. And the lie has, in fact, led us so far away from a normal society that you cannot even orient yourself any longer. In its dense grey fog, not even one pillar can be seen. All of a sudden, thanks to footnotes, you figure out that Jakubovic's book, In the World of the Outcasts, was published, although under a pseudonym, at the very same time the author was completing his czarist hard labor sentence and being sent off into exile. At the very time when that hard labor actually existed, it was about convict hard labor which was contemporary with it and not allegedly in the irrevocable past. Well now, just add that up. Just add that up and compare it with us. Compare that with the way my belated and shy novella managed to get out in the open by a miracle. And then they firmly lowered the barriers, bolted things up tightly, and locked the locks. And now it is forbidden to write not merely about something taking place in the present, but even about things that took place thirty and fifty years ago. And will we ever read about them during our lifetime? We are destined to go to our graves still immersed in lies and falsehoods. Moreover, even if they offered us the chance to learn the truth, would our free people even want to know it? Why G. Oxman returned from the camps in 1948 and was not rearrested, but lived in Moscow? His friends and acquaintances did not abandon him, but helped him. But they did not want to hear his recollections of camp, because if they knew about that, how could they go on living? After the war, a certain song became very popular. The noise of the city cannot be heard. No singer, even the most mediocre, could perform it without receiving enthusiastic applause. The chief administration of thoughts and feelings did not at first grasp what was going on, and they allowed it to be performed on the radio and on the stage. After all, it was Russian and had a folk motif. And then suddenly they discovered what it was all about and they immediately crossed it off the permitted list. The words of the song were about a doomed prisoner, about lovers torn apart. The need to repent existed still, and it stirred, and people who were steeped in lies could at least applaud that old song with all their hearts. 9. Cruelty And where, among all the preceding qualities, was there any place left for kind-heartedness? How could one possibly preserve one's kindness while pushing away the hands of those who were drowning? Once you have been steeped in blood, you can only become more cruel. And anyway, cruelty, class cruelty, was praised and instilled, and you would soon lose track, probably, of just where between bad and good that trait lay. And when you add that kindness was ridiculed, that pity was ridiculed, that mercy was ridiculed, you'd never be able to chain all those who are drunk on blood. 
My nameless woman correspondent from Arbat number 15 asks me about the roots of the cruelty characteristic of certain Soviet people. Why is it that the cruelty they manifest is proportionate to the defenselessness of the person in their power? And she cites an example, which is not at all what one might regard as the main one, but which I am going to cite here anyway. This took place in the winter of 1943 to 1944 at the Chelyabinsk railroad station, under a canopy near the baggage check room. It was minus 13 degrees. Beneath the shed roof was a cement floor, on which was trampled sticky snow from outside. Inside the window of the baggage check room stood a woman in a padded jacket, and on the nearer side was a well-fed policeman in a tanned sheepskin coat. They were absorbed in a kittenish, flirtatious conversation. Several men lay on the floor in earth-colored cotton duds and rags. Even to call them threadbare would be rank flattery. These were young fellows, emaciated, swollen, with sores on their lips. One of them, evidently in a fever, lay with bare chest on the snow, groaning. The woman telling the story approached him to ask who they were, and it turned out that one of them had served out his term in camp, another had been released for illness, but that their documents had been made out incorrectly when they were released, and as a result they could not get tickets to go home on the train. And they had no strength left to return to camp either. They were totally fagged out with diarrhoea. So then the woman telling the story began to break off pieces of bread for them, and at this point the policeman broke off his jolly conversation and said to her threateningly, What's going on, auntie? Have you recognized your relatives? You better get out of here. They will die without your help. And so she thought to herself, After all, they'll up and haul me in just like that and put me in prison. And that was quite right. What was to stop them? And she went away. How typical all this is of our society, what she thought to herself and how she went away, and that pitiless policeman and that pitiless woman in the padded jacket, and that cashier at the ticket window who refused them tickets, and that nurse who refused to take them into the city hospital, and that idiotic free employee at the camp who had made out their documents. It was a fierce and a vicious life, and by this time you would not, as in Dostoevsky and Chekhov, call a prisoner an unfortunate, but, if you please, only what. In 1938, Magadan school pupils threw stones at a column of women prisoners, as Tsurotseva recalls. Had our country ever known before, or does any other country know today, so many repulsive and divisive apartment and family quarrels? Every reader will be able to speak of many, and we will mention just one or two. In a communal apartment on Dolomanovskaya Street in Rostov lived Vera Krasutskaya, whose husband was arrested and perished in 1938. A neighbor, Anna Stolberg, knew about this, and for 18 years, from 1938 to 1956, reveled in her power and tormented Krasutskaya with threats. Catching her in the kitchen or in the corridor, she would hiss at Krasutskaya. If I say so, you can go on living, but I only have to say the word and the black Mariah will come for you. And it was only in 1956 that Krasutskaya decided to write a complaint to the prosecutor, and Stolberg then shut up. But they continued to live together in the same apartment. After the arrest of Nikolai Yakovlevich Semyonov in 1950 in the city of Lyubim, his wife, that very winter, kicked out his mother, Maria Ilinichna Semyonova, who had been living with them. Get out of here, you old witch! Your son is an enemy of the people! Six years later, when her husband returned from camp, she and her grown-up daughter Nadia drove him out into the street at night in his underpants. Nadia was so eager to do this because she needed the space for her own husband. And when she threw his trousers in her father's face, she shouted at him, Get out of here, you old rat! V. I. Zhukov recalls an exactly similar story from Kovrov. His wife drove him out. Get out, or I will have you jailed again, as did his stepdaughter. Get out, jailbird! When Semyonov's mother was kicked out of that apartment, she went to her childless daughter Anna in Yaroslavl. Soon the mother got on her daughter's and her son-in-law's nerves, and her son-in-law, Vasily Fyodorovich Metyolkin, a fireman, on his off-duty days, used to take his mother-in-law's face in the palms of his hands 
hold it tight so she couldn't turn away from him, and amuse himself by spitting in her face till he had no spit left, trying to hit her in the eyes and mouth. And when he was really angry, he would take out his penis and shove it in the old woman's face. Take it, suck it, and die. His wife explained his conduct to her brother when he returned. Well, what can I do when Vasya is drunk? What can you expect from a drunk? And then, in order to get a new apartment, we need a bathroom because there is no place to wash our old mother and we certainly can't drive her out to a public bath. They began to treat her tolerably well. And when, because of her, they'd got a new apartment, they packed the rooms with chests of drawers and sideboards and pushed her into a cranny between the wardrobe and the wall, fourteen inches wide, and told her to lie there and not stick her head out. And N.Y. Semyonov himself, who was by then living with his son, took the risk, without asking his son, of bringing his mother home. The grandson came home. The grandmother sank down on her knees before him. Vovochka, you're not going to kick me out? And the grandson grimaced. Oh, all right, live here until I get married. And it is quite apropos to add in regard to that same granddaughter, Nadia, Nadezhda Nikolaevna Topnikova, that around this time she completed the course in the historical and philological faculty of the Yaroslavl Pedagogical Institute, entered the party, and became an editor of the district newspaper in the city of Neya in Kostroma province. She was a poetess as well, and in 1961, while she was still in Lyubim, she rationalized her conduct in verse. If you're going to fight, then really fight. Your father, give it to him in the neck. Morals... People dreamed them up. I don't want to hear of them. In my life I'll march ahead, solely with cold calculation. But her party organization began to demand that she normalize her relationship with her father, and she suddenly began to write to him. Overjoyed, the father replied with an all-forgiving letter, which she immediately ran to show her party organization. And when they saw it, they put a check mark opposite her name, and that was that. And since then, all he gets from her are greetings on the great May and November holidays. Seven people were involved in this tragedy. And so there you have one little droplet of our freedom. In better brought-up families, they do not chase the relative who has suffered unjustly out onto the street in his underwear. But they are ashamed of him, and they feel burdened and imposed upon by his bitterly distorted world outlook. And one could go on enumerating further. One could name, in addition, ten. Slave psychology. That same unfortunate Babich in his declaration to the prosecutor. I understand that wartime placed more serious obligations and duties on the organs of government than to sort out the charges against individual persons and much else. But let us admit... If under Stalin this whole scheme of things did not just come into being on its own, and if instead he himself worked it all out for us point by point, he really was a genius. So there, in that stinking damp world in which only executioners and the most blatant of betrayers flourished, where those who remained honest became drunkards, since they had no strength of will for anything else, in which the bodies of young people were bronzed by the sun while their souls putrefied inside, in which every night the grey-green hand reached out and collared someone in order to pop him into a box. In that world, millions of women wandered about lost and blinded, whose husbands, sons or fathers had been torn from them and dispatched to the archipelago. They were the most scared of all. They feared shiny nameplates, office doors, telephone rings... Knocks on the door, the postman, the milkwoman, and the plumber. And everyone in whose path they stood drove them from their apartments, from their work, and from the city. Sometimes they trustingly based their hopes on the belief that a sentence without the right of correspondence was to be understood as meaning just that, and that when ten years had passed, he would write. Sometimes there really were camps without the right of correspondence, not only the atomic factories of the period from 1945 to 1949, but also, for example, Camp 29 of Karlag allowed no correspondence at all for a year and a half. They stood in line outside prisons, 
They went distances of fifty miles and more to places where they had heard food parcels were accepted for mailing. Sometimes they themselves died before the death of their relative in prison. Sometimes they learned the date of death only from the notation on a food parcel that had been returned, which read, Addressee died in hospital. Sometimes, as in the case of Olga Chavchavadze, who got to Siberia, carrying to her husband's grave a handful of the soil of his native land, they arrived on such a mission only to find that no one could tell them which mound he lay under, together with three other corpses. Sometimes, as in the case of Zelma Zhugor, they kept on writing letters to be delivered by hand to some Voroshilov or other, forgetting that Voroshilov's conscience had died long before he died himself. He did not even have the courage to shield his closest adjutant, Langovoy, from arrest and torture. And these women had children who grew up, and for each one there came a time of extreme need when they absolutely had to have their father back before it was too late, but he never came. A little folded triangle of school notebook paper with crooked handwriting, red and blue pencils in turn, one after the other. In all probability, a childish hand had put aside one pencil, rested, and then taken up a new one. Angular, inexperienced, tortuously written letters with breathing spaces between them, and sometimes even within words. Hello, Papa. I forgot how to write soon in school. I will go through the first winter. Come quickly, because it's bad. We have no Papa. Mama says you are away on work or sick. And what are you waiting for? Run away from that hospital. Here, yeah, Ola Yeshka ran away from hospital just in his shirt. Mama will sew you new pants, and I will give you my belt. All the same, the boys are all afraid of me. And Ola Yeshenka is the only one I never beat up. He also tells the truth. He is also poor, and I once lay in fever and wanted to die along with mother, and she did not want to, and I did not want to. Oh, my hand is numb from right. That's enough. I kiss you lots of times. Igoriok, six and one half years. I already know how to write on envelopes, and before mother comes from work, I will drop the letter in the mailbox. Manolis Glezos, in a clear and passionate speech told Moscow writers about his comrades languishing in the prisons of Greece. I understand that I have made your hearts tremble by my passionate speech, but I did it intentionally. I would like to have your hearts ache for those languishing in imprisonment. Raise your voice for the liberation of the Greek patriots. And those well-worn foxes, of course, they raised their voices. After all, a couple of dozen prisoners were languishing in Greece. And maybe Manolis himself did not understand the shamelessness of his appeal. And maybe, too, in Greece they do not have the proverb, Why grieve for others when there is sobbing at home? In various parts of our country we find a certain piece of sculpture, a plaster guard with a police dog which is straining forward in order to sink its teeth into someone. In Tashkent there is one right in front of the NKVD school. And in Ryazan, it is like a symbol of the city, the one and only monument to be seen if you approach from the direction of Mikhailov. And we do not even shudder in revulsion. We have become accustomed to these figures setting dogs onto people as if they were the most natural things in the world, setting the dogs onto us. Chapter 4 Several individual stories. I have fragmented the fates of all the prisoners I have previously mentioned in this book, subordinating their stories to the plan of the book, to the contours of the archipelago. I have steered away from biographical accounts. It would have been too monotonous. It's how they write and write, shifting all the burden of inquiry off the author's shoulders onto the reader's. But precisely because of this, I consider that at this point I have the right to cite several prisoners' stories in their entirety. 1. Anna Petrovna Skripnikova The only daughter of an ordinary worker of Mykop, Anna Skripnikova was born in 1896. As we already know from the history of the party under the cursed Tsarist regime... All paths to an education were closed to her, and she was condemned to the half-starving life of a female slave. And all this really did happen to her. But after the revolution, at the time she was accepted in the Mykop gymnasium. Anna grew up to become a big girl who also had a large head. 
A girl who was her gymnasium friend made a drawing of her which consisted solely of circles. Her head was round from all angles. She had a round forehead and round eyes which somehow expressed eternal perplexity. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.